Good morning, uh, Tan Sri Navarro. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here with you, and thank you for agreeing to have this short conversation. Um, as I look back at your very illustrious career, I wonder if you could share with us how was it like growing up in the then Federation of Malaya? I was born in 1935. Right. So I was in school at the Victoria Institution, and it was a good, it was a premier school. And um, we had a good education. Right. English was the medium. And uh, after that, I went to University of Malaya in Singapore. It was a tradition of learning and having fun and thinking very much like Malayans and later Malaysians. It was a time of uh, great expectations, of hope, of uh, aspiring to do your best to serve your country. Now, many of your contemporaries from, uh, you know, Edwin Tambu, Herman Hochstadt, that group, Niam Tong Dao, Niam others, Tong Dao yeah. said that the Japanese occupation had an indelible, left an indelible mark on your, all your careers and all your attitudes. Is that true? And what was your experience? Of That's things? very true. Then there was hardship. Uh, my father was working in the general clerical service, but there was not enough food in the house. And so, they asked me uh, whether I could sell curry puffs. Mm. And uh, I sold curry puffs, but I didn't like it. Mm. And when you talk about indelible mark, mm. the experience I had selling curry puffs ingrained in me a dislike to do business. Right. The way people treat you, why are your curry puffs so small, this, that, why so high, you know. <laughs> I couldn't take it. And my mother struggled to make curry puffs and I couldn't take it. So I said, I'm not going to be in business. But I then said, I, I don't want to sell curry puffs. So my father said, Can you, would you like to work? Because we need the money, we need the rice. Everybody got a sack of rice, whether you're a little boy or a grown-up, mm. if you worked. So I worked as an office boy. And the irony of life, or the blessing, the fairness in life sometimes, is that I worked as an office boy under the Japanese. Right in the Ministry of Transport and ended up my career as the Secretary General or the Permanent Secretary Ministry of Transport in, in Malaysia. Interesting, right? So there's a turns and twists. It taught me one thing, the hardship. You got to struggle in life. The world doesn't owe you a living. You learn to appreciate simple things. If you had a good place to write with some chicken curry, wow, that was a blessing. Sure. So you're not wasteful. Right. Still today, I cannot buy something expensive, because of that which I can do experience. without, you know. Because you learn the, uh, the, the, the value of being frugal, of being careful, and not wasteful. Now that brings me to your experience of Madeka, 1957. Can you share with yeah. us what, what feelings yeah, you yeah, had? Yeah, yeah. You remember Fajar days in right. Singapore? Mm -hmm. You remember the, G, uh, the uh, GPMS and, uh, you know, the r uh, raising of the, the Union Jack. Union Jack. That was resisted right. by the students. Sure. Uh, because they say, well, we are going to get independence at our, and this convention, student convention, you are having the, the British flag. We don't want any flag if we can't have a Malayan flag mm. or Singapore flag or whatever. And so that was the feeling, the feeling of resurgence, the feeling of, of independence. And we followed very carefully the developments taking place on the, uh, in the Singapore and Malaysian front in regard to the negotiations for, for independence. Mm. Tungkor Brahman going to London and up and down. And uh, that was the feeling, look, and we are preparing ourselves now in our final years. When we graduate, we'll be getting jobs in the new independent Malaysia and, and self-governing Singapore. And so there was a special pride, a special anticipation, a special hope that we are equipping ourselves to serve the country. That was shared by all Malayans, right? Oh yeah, all Malayans. Regardless Malayan. of race, no, colour, no, religion no. and all of that. Now the straight settlements, right, the way the British are divided, right? so Penang, Malacca and Singapore were always a little bit peripheral to the central concerns of the Federation. 
And I'm wondering whether that British kind of formulation led to some of the differences that were going to emerge more and more strongly as the years went by because Malaya got independent in 57, Singapore became self-government in 59, and even though there was a convergence at some point between, say, Lee Kuan Yew and Tunku Abdul Rahman, that convergence became more and more of a divergence. Do you want to reflect briefly yeah. on that? I think there's a difference between Singapore uh, as part of the Strait Settlement mm. as opposed to Malacca and Penang. Right. But there was a common thread, you're right. Mm. I mean, there were a lot of people in Penang who said, look, we don't want independence. Right. And Malacca too, and Singapore definitely. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry, you don't want to be, you know, we yeah. want to be by ourselves and yeah. not part of the mainstream right. Malayans, uh, right. Malay states. Right. So, but to a lesser extent, the Malacca and Penang, because mm. we're in one sure. uh, entity. Uh, but uh, Singapore, for sure, they were always different. And um, I think there was this feeling that they always thought they were better. Mm. Of course, it's, it's, urban, it's, it's an urban center. And, uh, and uh, they're a small, concentrated population. And they were ahead, actually, with their education and their quality. So they had that sense of... Um, superiority, right or wrong, which reflected, epi was epitomized by Lee Kuan Yew. And I recall as a junior officer attending parliamentary session to take down notes. Right. And uh, I was, even it, me, at that young age was struck by the arrogance that he showed in, in talking to, to Tunku Abdul Rahman and uh, our cabinet here, when he was here in parliament as part of Malaysia as very condescending, arrogant, and uh, hurtful. You know? mm. And I have always entertained this view that if he had been only a bit more civil, mm. uh, more gracious, more understanding, more aware of the sensitivities here of a not-so-sophisticated society, a less urbane society, uh, I think we could have still carried on in Malaysia, benefiting all. Right. We would have benefited in Malaya, Malay, uh, Peninsula, uh, and Sabah and Sarawak, and uh, themselves, Singapore itself. Because so, it's an unnatural split, I still believe. From your point of view, do you think that it was essentially unnatural because of the economic, political, landscapes considerations. So do you think it was unnatural in the sense that the two personalities that were critical to this whole union decided that they just couldn't work together? I think it was because uh, Lee Kuan Yew felt that he, he was a prima donna. Mm -hmm. I don't think he found himself able to work with Malayan leadership mm -hmm. in a somewhat secondary role. Right. He wanted his own space, his own kingdom. And so, the differences that there were, were not so fundamental. Mm. It was a personality clash in many ways, mm. and arrogance, I think, on his part. And um, he, I don't think he saw long term. Unfortunately, I mean, he's a great man. I respect him a great deal, great intellect. But at that time, I don't think he had the foresight to recognize that, look, let me be part of Malaysia, contribute and make this a great country with Singapore, Malaya, Peninsula Malaysia, Malaya, and uh, Sabah and Sarawak. Though, though but instead, he just fought, you know, he didn't, he didn't give ground. And well, I mean, that to me is not very statesmanlike. Though, uh, looking back, Mr. Lee himself has said that the long-term future of Singapore still belongs with and to Malaysia, so... No, I didn't hear that, but if he said that, yeah, yeah then it's a contradiction in terms. Yeah. He could have, you know, fought his battles from within, rather than have to do things so, and make things so difficult, that people here got desperate. I think our people too could have exercised more restraint and say, look, this is a young Turk, let's accommodate him and see how we can work together, rather than just dismiss him. And in a way, cutting our nose to spite our face. Sure. Now, independence brings with it, of course, a sense of uh, self-making um, and self-determination uh, and all of that. So, 
not to make the conversation too serious, some of the um, you know, persons from your vintage at the University of Malaya in Singapore said that one of the big, uh, perhaps you know, jokingly, mistakes was to have the university transfer to Kuala Lumpur. Because unlike your generation, they can just pick up the phone and say, hey, can you solve this problem between the two countries? Ever since the university was set up in KL and students began to diverge, it's more difficult for the top echelon civil servants, even the political leaders, to have that kind of uh, empathy, fellow yeah. feeling, and sense of common destiny. Do you see this as a kind of a... Well, it's very different now. I mean, I was a permanent secretary of transport when right. Niam Tong Do was permanent secretary yeah. transport in Singapore at that time. And I remember we had a negotiation right. on Woodlands. Sure. Railway, like Railway K KTM, all, yeah. you know. And uh, interesting story, there was, a, I forget his name now, Lee, I think, a deputy mm -hmm. from say, who came along with Niam. Mm -hmm. And we were talking across the table, and he said, uh, but I found this guy, this colonel chap, mm -hmm. national service colonel, right. uh, deputy secretary general, from say, uh, somewhat um, hostile, aggressive, assertive. It's not the style of negotiation, I thought. Mm -hmm. that. But Niam was very quiet, calm, in intervening at the right time, making his point very clear, concise. So I said, okay, let's go and have lunch. We went to the Lake Club. Mm. So Niam, I was the host, so right. I, I took him along in my car. I said, Niam, why is your chap so aggressive? Well, he doesn't have to be. Mm. He said, not to worry. This is her. <laughs> so I got the message, I didn't want to belabor it. And he said, never mind, Raymond. He said, today's Friday, I'll go back, and I'll settle it, I'll let you know by Monday. Right. You know, I think we've both got reasonable positions. We'll work out something, but I can't say anything now. I need to <clears throat> have it uh, authenticated. So he went back, Monday, first thing he called me, hey, Raymond, I think it's all settled. Right. You see, that kind of relationship we don't have. If we come back to you, you were one of the more quickly promoted civil servants. You arrived at the top fairly quickly. Was it easy for you as a permanent secretary to galvanize and garner support from people around you, vis-a-vis, -vis, say, your predecessors, the Orang Putes? I think there was a great feeling of, we are Malaysians, we are Malayans. So people rallied around you. If you were you tried, you tried. I didn't say I was. If I tried to be a good leader, mm. a fair leader, and the people recognized in me as a Malaysian and non-Malay and non-Muslim, a true patriot. Mm -hmm. And I like to believe, I like to feel that I have always been a Malaysian at heart. Uh, and that uh, I'm Malaysian first and foremost. And I've felt duty-bound and dedicated to the uh, commitment to serve the country to the best of my ability. As they say in the civil service, to serve God, King and country. You've alluded to the, the, the fact of a good leader and since, since you've done that, may I ask you to just maybe expand a little bit on what you think makes a good leader? I will give a very simple, realistic, Maybe philosophical answer. To my mind, a good leader is someone who serves the people to the best of his ability with integrity, intelligence, and good sense of consultation. And even from the fisherman and farmer, you can learn a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. If you're honest, have an open mind and listen, and are determined to take the necessary action, whether it is popular or not, then you are a good leader. And people will rally around you because they know you are sincere and you serve the best interest, their best interest, not your own best interest. Mm. So would you say that in the, in the years that you've been a very intimate participant in the way Malaysia has shaped its own history, would you say that given these qualities of good leadership, would you say that these qualities obtained in the leaders that you worked with or were they, was there like an 80% achievement of this, realization of this, or was it a 50-50? Yeah. What would you say? 
Maybe to be safe and also to, I think to be realistic, mm. about 50-50 because I think for the first few prime ministers, a lot of this ideals were observed. Right. But then politics became business. Right. And money politics seeped in. Mm -hmm. Corruption seeped in. Mm -hmm. Cronyism seeped in. Um, warlordism seeped in. And in democracies, unless you have a very strong opposition, you will run into troubles like in Malaysia and Singapore, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. People get very unhappy when they find monopolistic government. It's what the World Bank now reasonably calls state capture. Sure. Have you come across that? Yes, term? yeah. Yeah. That is happening all over the world. But to a less greater or lesser extent, depending on the strength of the people's participation, the strength uh, of the democracy and uh, the vibrancy of the opposition. If the opposition has never been in government, then you have state capturism really capture. Mm. And uh, there's a monopoly of power and uh, it's very difficult to shake off abuses. Mm. So, uh, all the successful democracies we know have had alternate governments. So now you, you, you touched on some very key aspects of uh, even good governance and all of this. Um, when you were helping to draft the new economic policy, did some of you anticipate that given the frames of that, these things were going to be the almost inevitable result in the years following? You see, I was at Harvard at that time. Right. I was not here in KL <clears throat> during the uh, May 13th riots. Right. So I was not traumatized. Mm. But when I came back and started 69, 70, you know, the right. new economic policy yeah. was <clears throat> evolved. And I was the reference here from the Treasury right. Economic Division on this interagency yeah. group at the Economic Planning Unit. Right. And uh, I could see that most of my colleagues were tr highly traumatized. Mm. And I could see that the environment had changed. The psychology had changed. People were angry, desperate, sensitive, fearful. So we hammered out a policy, there were, you know, it turned out to be a good policy at that time. Mm. But even then, there were some extremist views as to how far we should go left or right. right. But I think they struck the right balance. The leadership, <clears throat> Tunko Raman, Tun Razak, they were very wise men, mm. pragmatic, mm. and uh, very Malaysian in the outlook. Mm. And uh, they struck a compromise which was acceptable. I mean, who can quarrel with this first prong of the NEP? Sure. Eradication or elevation of poverty, regardless of race. Sure. I don't care if he's Malay, Chinese, sure. Karazan, Murut, or whatever, mm. Indian. You help the poor. Mm. No, how can you quarrel with it? Mm. Then the removal of the identification of race with occupation. At that time, the thinking was, why should most farmers and fishermen be Malays? Mm. Why should most businessmen be Chinese? Why should most uh, tappers be Indians? Mm. He need to, so they he need to uh, cross uh, cross uh, fertilize, and so that was the op and you can't find ob objection to that. So we all supported it, but unfortunately, during the course of time, Western interests took over. And then you had the creation of an elitist group. And more attention went towards, although in poverty, I think we are one of the leading examples of the world, in the world. Within a short period, we managed to reduce poverty from 50% of the population to now, by UN figures standard, by 2%. Now, this series of interviews that we are doing are basically commissioned by the Institute for Societal Leadership in Singapore Management University. I wonder whether, in your thinking, there is a clear difference between, say, political leadership, uh, economic leadership, and this societal leadership. The point I'm leading to is that if there are very strong leaders in the sphere of society and societal leadership, 
is powerful, then perhaps the political leadership might be a little bit more advised to be cautious in how they work out what you call money politics. No, I think you have summed it up well. You've got the political, the economic and the societal. I think they all have a role to play. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the political leadership has been dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, not that it's bad, but it has perhaps uh, been too strong. Mm -hmm. And the economic leadership should be independent, mm -hmm. really. But there was a point of time when somebody, one prime minister said, look, why should the Chinese make all the money? Why can't the Malays also make money? Mm -hmm. Which is fine. Right. But we must have now Malaysia in Corp. And that was also fine. Mm. Except the implementation. If you have the right guys running the, the big statutory bodies, the GLCs, uh, if it's free and competitive and meritocratic, more meritocratic. So where do you think it went wrong? It was not definitely in the conception of it, right? And you said it was in the yeah. implementation. So was it like the wrong people got the right jobs or the wrong people got the wrong jobs? And that's forward. politics, isn't it? right? So how do you how do you propose that a nation prepares itself for these extremes of corruption, cronyism, perhaps sometimes even uh, one ethnic group getting more privileges than another? Uh, in contemporary times, I mean, we are so global these days. That do you think these threats are still <laughs> getting? more and more powerful or do you think in time they're all going to be you know, erased? I hope in time it will be erased. I think we're beginning to move towards more liberal, competitive society. But to me, the pace is too slow. Whereas others are running, if we are walking, we will lose out. Mm. But this country actually is a very blessed country. Mm. I mean, you look out to see the green, there's plenty of rain, plenty of sunshine, the land is pretty fertile, the land to population ratio is pretty favourable. Mm. See, unlike Singapore, you've got major constraints. Sure. Yeah, you can move out, expand. Yeah. You just drive from you know, Singapore to Penang and you look at the vast expanse and mm. the potential. Sure. So everything is in our favour. Even our racial mix is our asset. But I think some nasty politicians try to make it out as if it's a liability. Right. What do you look at this multiracial group here? Your crew, yourself and all that. Right. You know, we can learn from each other and we can be a model of a country like a mini United Nations. But unfortunately, some politician and some and others want to be greedy and Capture power, state capture. Capture power for themselves in perpetuity. And this is the problem. So how do you solve it? There must be a more active, lively civil society. A stronger opposition. And the guy, you can't aim big, aim small. Your own leader, your own constituency, your own parliamentarian, your own state representative, your own local council chap, if he's elected, but even if he's appointed, Show your dissent, show your opposition, show your dissatisfaction with their service. And if that happens, that's the pressure of the people. Now, as you look back on your long career, can you sum up in maybe two or three sentences your major challenges? I think the major challenges has always been how do we develop this country into a truly Malaysian entity. How are we able to overcome the differences in race and religion and vested political and economic interests that do not necessarily serve public interest? That has been the challenge. Our constitution reflects it and provides safeguards. Our Rukun Negara as aspires to overcome these problems, but even in the United States, even today, after what, 260 years or something? Yeah. You still have the allegations of white policemen going for black folks. So it's a huge human problem. And you need strong leadership and you need people who are aware of it and say, look, how can I play my role? 
how can I just remain aloof and uh, indifferent? Because it's affecting me and it'll affect my children and my grandchildren. And I have a duty to God and to myself and to my progeny, to my future, that they should be served well. I can't change the world, but I can change myself and change things around me. Sure. So I have a motto in my book. I've written 10 books and one of which is an autobiography. I say every day I do my best. Right. To God, I leave the rest. Oh, right. Okay. I can't do better than my best. So then I'll sit back and rest. Sure. And that's what I'm trying to do. Sure. <laughs> now, I gather that uh, in your more recent um, experiences, you've been the target of some threats. Mm. Um, but you're still continuing in spite of it all. I mean, if I may ask, uh, what's your motivation for doing this? For continuing to yeah. fight battles that have not always been stacked for you, but yeah. stacked against you? I have always been critical in my heart, internally, in my conscience, that people don't speak up. I'm a Christian. Mm. I'm taught in the Bible, speak up, speak out, tell the truth. Right. As long as I'm not dishonest, as long as I'm not abrasive, not rude, why can't I say what I want to say? If it's not benefiting me, per se, but it's of general public interest. So I cannot criticize people for not speaking up if I don't speak up. Right. In my way, I'm trying to encourage people to hey, say more, speak up, no, wallop, harder, I say. Look. First of all, firstly, I'm a civil servant. I want to be civil. Number two, you tell me to do it, what are you doing? Everybody in Malaysia, Singapore, ASEAN, must play a role. You cannot just be pointing fingers at others and not at yourself. So that is my motivation. Be true to yourself and practice what you preach. You want others to, to learn from your example for what it's worth. Live up to your example or your expectations of others and of society. So would you agree that education is the answer so that we, we try to rectify the mistake? I think as we all, I think the consensus is you need awareness education and good education, not education for the sake of going to school and university. Yeah. Right. It must be quality education and not necessarily education that is introduced or, or practiced for the marketplace, but to turn out good holistic individuals who have their talent, God-given talent, utilized or optimized to the highest. And that's what you're doing in a wonderful way because this morning I couldn't help but uh, note the number of people who came up so respectfully to you to thank you for writing and for oh. making them more aware of what Malaysia is and of the issues and challenges facing the instance, I really yeah, want to thank yeah. you for this interview. But well, don't forget, thank you so much, there are people yeah. also come up to me and say, bloody hell, why are you talking so much? That I didn't <laughs> hear this morning. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed thank the you, interview. Sir. Thank you. Good for you.